good morning or evening or afternoon, Living Temple crew. My name is Dave. If you don't know me, I'm one of the pastors at Living Temple, and it is my pleasure to bring you the word this morning, evening or afternoon. Uh, we have been doing a series called He Is and I Am. And basically, it's all about what happens in our life, what changes by being in proximity in relationship to Jesus. You know, we've looked at he is saviour, so we are saved. He is father, so we are children. Today, I'm stoked to be speaking on the idea that he is freedom and we are free. I love being free in Christ. There's one thing I've realised over this ISO time. I, I always got to give a disclaimer. I don't feel like, I feel bad for our friends in health and education and the people whose businesses are struggling in their, and everything like that. But there's also a little bit of a forced rest for a lot of people. And during this time, I've actually felt free. I've felt free to just be myself, to connect to God, to enjoy my family. It's been good. But that's just a minor expression of the freedom we have in Christ. You know, when we look at what he has done to pave our freedom and how he does that, there's no reason to stay bound up and downtrodden and pharisaic about the situation. We've been set free. And it's really good. So in a moment... I'm going to um, bring you to a passage from Luke 11. But then before that, I have to tell you a story about our house. So the other day, our house is clean, man. Like our house is pretty clean, especially over the ISO time. We, you know, we've given the place spotless just does a good job. I like it. It's good. It's clean. But the other day, there was like a dead rat somewhere in the roof. And the first day I thought, oh man, is that a dead rat? And I was hoping it was outside. And then the next day, like, there was another rat. There was a, the, the smell had gone crazy. So I went in the office and I'm like, oh, man, there's a dead rat somewhere here. Now, I hate dead stuff, like dead marsupials in particular. I hate dead rats and, like, are they marsupials or rodents? I don't know. Um, and I won't touch them. Jess and I and some of the men in the church are going to, like, rip on me here. I think of you, Dave Wagemaker, for some reason. But if there's, like a mousetrap that ever goes off or a dead rat anywhere, I, I, I can't get rid of it. I, I have to beg, borrow and steal from everyone else to get rid of it anyway. So Josiah, my son, he's 11 now. And one cool thing when your sons start, you know, getting like 11 and they start paying off, like they start being able to do stuff that's helpful, like help around the yard. And anyway, I said to him, Joe, look, man, if, you've, if you find this rat, I love it so much. And he knows my hate for rats. He knows how much money to find the rat. Anyway, we, we got to 30 bucks, which for an 11-year-old kid is heaps. But I was like, man, I would have gone to 50 because I hate rats so much. Anyway, it was up in the very corner. So for about an hour, he's crawling around in the roof trying to find this dead rat, trying to smell it out and couldn't find it. And I had a hunch I knew where it was, but I'm like, man, I'm not going there. So anyway, we started taking the roof tiles off one at a time. And as soon as we took the first one off, it was like, oh, it just hit you like a ton of bricks. I'm like, Joe, put your head in there and look around. So he's looking around with the torch. And then I pulled a few more tiles off and he's looking around with the torch. And then eventually we ended up taking like 15 tiles off and found the dead rat right in the corner. And it was gross. You know how they like stink and they're in a... I don't know, in a fetal position, but for a rat. And it was like stiff and stuff. And as soon as I saw it, I ran down the top of the roof. I ran off because I hate them so much, man. I don't know why. They just gross me out. Anyway, he had to psych himself up to it. But I gave him a pair of tongs that he used, not like tongs that we then chucked away just in case you've had dinner at our house in the last couple of weeks. So he used the tongs to get the dead rat, chucked it away, and the stench was gone. And it was crazy because as soon as the dead rat was gone, the stench was gone. And not only did the house look clean, it smelled clean and it was clean. And I was just glad to see the back end of that rat. But how's Josiah's form? So we've seen the rat. He knows it's there. He knows I've run off to the other side of the roof and he's like 35, Dad. And I'm not sure. I would have gone to 50. But 35 is what we settled on and you got the dead rat. While I'm up there, my neighbor yells out, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I'm just paying the son 35 bucks to get a rat. He's like, I'll do it for 25 next time. So anyway, I'm happy to get rid of that. Now, Jesus almost calls the Pharisees in this passage we're going to look at houses with rats. He doesn't say houses with rats. He says whitewashed tombs. 
He calls these guys dead tombs. The Pharisees, they, they, they are continually butting heads with Jesus. But in this passage, he's trying to reveal to them that they have no freedom, that their religion is binding them up rather than setting them free, that it's making their life worse instead of better, that they're getting exponentially less happy than more happy, that their religion is just not working. It doesn't work because the joy of the Lord is not their strength. The, the, the obedience to rules is what rules their religion. And so if you've got your Bible, open it up to Luke 11, please, from verse 37. It'll come up here. I won't put my hands up because when I did that to Jess, it was really hard for her to put the points in there. Sorry, Jess. Luke eleven thirty-seven. When Jesus had finished speaking, a Pharisee invited him to eat with him. So he went in and he reclined at the table. But the Pharisee was surprised when he noticed that Jesus did not first wash before a meal. You get, straight away, he starts getting a sense of how unfree or bound the Pharisees are. They've got the Messiah, the Son of God, the miracle worker in the house, reclining at the table. They could have any encounter with him. They could ask him any question and have something miraculous happen. But they're like, he didn't wash his hands properly. You know, there was, there was all these rituals according to Old Testament law which Jesus had fulfilled around ceremonially being cleansed. And so the Pharisees and the teachers of the law still were obeying that. But Jesus is like, dude, if, you're, if your spirit's clean, your whole body's clean. Like, that, it's not about that anymore. Anyway, so they noticed that he didn't wash before the meal. They didn't say anything, but Jesus could smell the dead rat. Then the Lord said to him, now then, you Pharisee, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you're full of greed and wickedness. Imagine how much that would hit your guest. You've got your guest, he's just come and reclined at the table. He didn't wash his hands. And all of you said, suddenly he says, you know what you're like? You're like when you get a cup of coffee and the kids have accidentally put it in the cupboard instead of the dishwasher and you didn't know when you were making your coffee and then you poured the water and then all this white goo and yuck stuff and fermented poo, whatever else is like popping up into the coffee. You guys are like that. <laughs> you know, on the outside of the cup, you might look clean, but inside you're gross, you're dead, you're decaying, you're full of greed, you're full of wickedness. And then he goes, you foolish people, verse 40. Did not one, the one who make the outside also make the inside? But now as for what is inside you, be generous to the poor and everything will be clean for you. In other words, he's saying, look, there's no evidence of any change in your life. You're not free. You're bound by these rules. You've got to wash your hands. You've got to sit around making sure everyone else washes their hands. You're just these nitpicking religious yuck people, um, like coffee just fermenting up out of a skanky cup. You need to know that if you had a real freedom, everything inside you would be free. And it would result in things like being generous to the poor. What he's not saying, he's not saying if you're generous to the poor, you can earn your salvation. Or he's not saying the Pharisees, okay, give to the poor and everything will be sweet. What he's saying is if you had something real, you would be generous to the poor because you'd be free in Christ. I love verse 42. It's not like Jesus is a people pleaser in any way, okay? So, you know, if you go to somebody's house and they offend you, you kind of probably extend a few courtesies because, you know, they've had you over for dinner. <laughs> Not Jesus, not at least to the Pharisees. He says, Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give a tenth of your mint, rue, and other kinds of herbs, but you neglect the justice and the love of God. You know that mindset? Oh, you know, I've tithed, I've done my bit, I've paid my way, God's cool with me. He's saying to them, Look, you, yeah, yeah, you think just because you've given a tenth of the mint and rue, whatever rue is, and other garden herbs, that you're fine? How's that work? I gave you 100% in the first place. What, you just give me back a portion of what I gave you? You should have practiced, he says in verse 42, you should have practiced the latter without leaving the former undone. In other words, be generous. Give a tenth if you want. Give some of your rue, whatever that is. But don't think that that's the end of it. Don't think that's what completes your faith. Don't think that's the extent of your worldview. Don't neglect justice, he says. You guys are the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. You're the dispensers of justice. You're the interpreters of the law and you're misusing that in the name of being religious. But all you're doing is giving this and that. It's formulaic, it's arbitrary, and it's not free. 
keeps going, verse 43. You ever had a dinner guest come over and just give it to you? I haven't, but the Pharisees did. Woe to you, Pharisees, again. How many woes? I think it's like seven woes. You love the most important seats in the synagogue and respectful greetings in the marketplace. Do you know if you can tell if somebody is free? is that they don't care about titles, they don't care about status, they don't need to sit at the best places in the dinner party in order to feel important. They know they're intrinsically important. You know, someone who's really centred on the Lord and free doesn't care about that, that garbage, but the Pharisees were dead inside, so they loved the most important seats in the synagogue. They loved it when people walked in and went, ooh, Pharisee Joe's here, aren't we blessed to see him? You know, all these... Big greetings in the marketplace. You know, people would walk towards him go, wow, look at this giant of the faith. And, and look, you'd be, you wouldn't have to stretch very far to see some of these attitudes happening within the churches as well. You know, your green rooms and your VIP sections and all that garbage. Well, a real person who has freedom in Christ doesn't need any of that because they don't need the accolades of man. They don't need the praise of people. They've got the affirmation of God. So there's freedom in that because he is freedom. So we can be free. Woe to you, verse 44, because you're like unmarked graves, which people walk over without knowing. You're dead, is what he's saying. You're basic, you're decaying, you're rotting, you're gross. You're just like a dead rat in the corner, right? Just stinking out the place, unmarked graves. Have you noticed that Jesus is never ruthless like this with the poor or the broken or the needy or those that are genuinely seeking him? He's literally only ruthless with those that think they can be freed without Christ. Those that are bound by rules and and rituals and yuckness. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And not only are they bound themselves, they've got to go around binding everyone else up. You can't eat that, you can't wear that, take your hat off. It's all that garbage, right? So he gives it to the Pharisees saying, you're not free, you're dead. Now, remember, in the judicial system, there was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And although they were quite similar, they had different functions anyway. They were still two different groups, but they were in cahoots with each other a lot. Verse 45, I love, I love this. One of the experts in the law answered him, Teacher, when you say these things... You insult also us. In other words, he's like 21st century poor guy on Facebook. Oh, I'm offended. I'm offended by what you're saying, Jesus. You can't say that. You know, when you say these things, you insult us also. Now, why this teacher in the law wanted to draw that attention off the Pharisee onto himself, nobody knows. But I bet you the Pharisee is like, oh, yes. We're done with our tongue lashing. But, you know, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. You've offended me, Jesus. Now, Jesus didn't say, oh, sorry, can I give you a cuddle? He replies in verse 46, and you experts in the law, woe to you. Because you load down with burdens, you load people down with burdens that they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. You know, the teachers of the law were known for like, okay, if you want to be good, do this, 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 help this, 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 this. They weren't willing to do it themselves. You know, that, that, that's what happens when somebody's not free is they need to go and burden everybody else, go and project their legalism and brokenness on everybody else. And they only feel good when everyone else feels worse. It's like spiritual bullying. It's the worst thing ever. And these teachers of the law were bandits for it because they had no freedom. You can't be free being bound by a system that is just perpetually doing, doing, doing. It has to be about being. And once you're in Christ, you can be free to do, but it comes first with the freedom that comes from being in Christ. Now, this is a pastor on the Gold Coast. A friend of mine, we've been friends for 15 years, and his name's Jeremy Fredericks. Or in Australian, Jezza. Anyway, Jezza is a pastor of a church called House Church up off the highway near Somerset. And he is, whenever I think of a, a pastor or a leader who's willing to do what he asks other people to do, it's Jezza. You know, we've been in ministry together for 15 years, not in the same churches, but in the same networks. And 
always, always, he will do whatever he asks anyone else to do. If he's got people digging a hole, he's the first there digging the hole. If there needs to be a youth event set up, he's there first. He knows how to lead, but he leads by example. Right? When they were renovating a church a couple of months ago, he's the guy there standing all night. He's the guy leading the charge, painting, doing whatever it takes. He's the man. He can do that because he's free. He's free to choose to do that. He doesn't do it because he's sitting at home going, oh, if I don't do it, the pastors, the congregation's not going to like me or God's going to be mad at me. No, he's got a freedom that allows him to serve. He has freedom in Christ. These guys didn't. Jesus keeps going. By now you're like, hey, is it dessert time, man? Can everyone leave now, please? Verse 47. Woe to you, because you build tombs for the prophets, and it was your ancestors who killed them. So you testify that you approve of what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets, and you build their tombs. Because of this, God and his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and others they will persecute. Therefore, this generation will be held responsible for the blood of the prophets that has been shed since the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who was killed between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, this generation, speaking to them, will be held responsible for it all. Jesus is like your teacher of the law. You want to be all spiritual and holy, but you're a murderer. And you're in a line of murderers and you're going to be responsible for that. And it doesn't matter how much you appear holy, you stink like a dead rat in the corner of the house because you haven't been cleaned. Not only have you not been cleaned, that you, you've been responsible for bloodshed of the men and women of God who came before you. Don't get on your high horse about being religious. Don't get on your high horse about being obedient. You're the very problem you claim to be the solution to. <laughs> And he finishes, 52, Woe to you experts in the law, because you've taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered, and you have hindered those who were entering. In other words, he's like, you know what? You think you're the key to salvation, and you haven't even entered yourself. You think your ways are the ways of righteousness, but you know nothing of it. Not only do you know nothing of it, you stop others entering. You're so bound up that you can't even allow others to be free. You have to squish them as well. There's a the thing about not being free is that you just can't let it be. You have to go and antagonize and bind and minimize everything. Verse 53. When Jesus went outside, I like that. Was it he went outside because the meal was over or someone was like, hey, can you leave now? Or he's like, settle this and the tension's so thick. He's like... I'm just going to step outside. Jesus went outside and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law began to oppose him fiercely and besiege him with questions, waiting to catch him in something he might say. I love it. A couple of minutes ago, they're like, hey, Jesus, come and recline at the table with us. Come be one of us. We're the religious guys. We're the best. And then maybe half an hour later, they're gathering together saying, man, we need to fiercely ask these guys questions and trip him up. No freedom. I'm not free because I'm good. I'm not good. One thing I left out of the story before is when we pulled that um, tile away, I ran away, yes, but I was swearing because I'm so freaking scared of rats that that was a swear word just came out of me. And I don't want to condone that. I don't think it's like legitimate. And I also don't want to minimize sin. But that doesn't take away my freedom because I'm on a process with my mouth, right? Freedom doesn't come in any other way but proximity to Jesus. When someone who really knows Jesus is really free. Somebody who really understands that he is the key to freedom. It's about knowing him and him appropriating the freedom to you. You know what a prisoner can do nothing about getting themselves free. The judge sets them free. And once they're free, and once they've declared that they are set free, it's done. It's a done deal. They have freedom. It's such a waste of this life, living like a Pharisee or a teacher of the law. 
trying to not only micromanage your own faith to keep it in a box, but having this innate desire to micromanage everybody else's. Like these clowns. Whitewashed tombs, pretty on the outside, dead on the inside. A clean house with a dead rat. When you go to a clean house with a dead rat, all you can smell is the rat. Doesn't matter that the floor is clean, doesn't matter that the windows are shining. The dead rat is all you can focus on. You are not bound. I am not bound. Because of the freedom I have in Christ, I can choose to do what I like. Now, people might be like, oh, is that a license to sin? No, because I actually have the Holy Spirit like you do too. And even though I can choose to do what I like, I choose to be obedient. I choose to be generous. I choose to be loving because that's what I like. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in me and that's what overflows. Have you noticed that all the rebuttals Jesus had to all these acts and works that the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did all came down to justice for the poor, generosity of the poor, kindness to society, not loading people down with burdens you're not willing to carry yourself. You know, you know if you're free. You know if you've got freedom in Christ. And if you don't, it's time to let yourself be free. He brings freedom. And faith in him appropriates freedom to us. I just don't have much more to say than that. I pray this is landing. I really need you to know that there's nothing you can do to make God love you more. Like, or less. If God is love, like we learned uh, last week or the week before with Jess, if God is love and you are loved, then you are free to be yourself. Can I tell you guys a secret? Most people know I hate dancing. Okay, so like we'll go to like a wedding of people I love and Dave Baker all the time and Andy are like doing those moves where they're trying to like pull you on the dance floor with a pretend rope. I think it's witchcraft, but anyway. And then there's all the, you know, everyone's dancing and having a laugh. I won't do it. I hate it, man. I just don't feel free in that environment to be able to express myself. Now, you might want to dig into the psychological reasons of that. I don't think there's any. I think I just hate it. But at home, I can't believe I'm confessing this. Maybe it's because I'm at home and I feel like comfortable. But at home, I dance with the kids all the time. I dance with the kids all the time because I have no inhibitions before them. I have no, like, worry about what they think of me. I know they love me and I can be free to be myself. You know that it's because I love them and they love me that there's freedom between a son and a dad and a daughter and a dad. You know you have that same freedom with Christ. I just want you to walk in it. I just pray you walk in it. If you're bound, if you can smell yourself as a Pharisee, if you're like, man, there's just a bit of dead rat on me, it's not about focusing on the rat. Just get rid of that by the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then you're free, and those who are free are free indeed. So I pray you live free this week. I pray you love free this week, and that God's spirit rests upon you. So for few, for this week, life groups um, up to, I think, five visitors can be in your house. Discuss this. When we email this out, there's going to be some supplementary verses. Read them. Discuss them in your life group. Think about them with loved ones and, and know that you, have, you are free because he brings freedom. I love you guys. See you later.